Well, welcome. Uh, I'm going to uh, maybe set the context for a second and introduce myself, and then we'll let the, the panelists here kind of take it away. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Coughlin. I'm new to the college as of last summer uh, when I joined uh, a newly established effort on behalf of the college known as the Office of Entrepreneurship and Technology Transfer, in which the institution is really thinking about and making a significant investment in in innovation, entrepreneurship, kind of pan-institution. Students, faculty, staff, alums, the community, social ventures to for-profit ventures. And my responsibility uh, in this new office is to oversee new venture and incubation. So maybe a few of you have heard about the new innovation center that actually kind of beta launched today at Four Courier Place. And so I'm uh, the director of that uh, new innovation center. So a lot of excitement really kind of brewing around entrepreneurship and innovation. And this panel tonight that Rocky has taken a leadership to organize the past few years now uh, will hopefully reveal to all of you just what is social entrepreneurship? How do we bring some definition to that world? For all of you that are maybe thinking about different ventures, how do you actually put that idea into action? And I'm joined by two just fabulous panelists today that, that hopefully through their own experiences, trials and errors can maybe reveal to you all how they all went about it. My personal background, just as a quick, uh, quick uh, aside, was I was a really a product of higher education. I did my undergraduate at Princeton, so don't, don't hold it against me, in which, which I established a, uh, an educational technology company, built it with my roommate, ended up uh, growing it out of college, and ended up merging it with another company. So I'm really passionate and, and uh, uh, excited that, that this platform here at Dartmouth College can really kind of be a, a gateway to exposing you all to, the, uh, to really the joys of, of, of entrepreneurship and, and bringing ideas into action. So without further ado, how tonight's going to kind of operate is uh, Henrik here and Grace will kind of provide some introductions, and we're just going to enter into a conversation that again will hopefully unveil to you uh, a little bit more about uh, the topic and then really open it up all to you. We, we, we would love to make this kind of very uh, experiential in nature, interactive in nature, and, 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 and listen to your questions and, and try to provide some you know, clarity to maybe the, uh, the thoughts and insights that you all can provide. So without further ado, Grace, why don't you kind of kick us off with just a little bit of a bio and sure. where you come from. Am I supposed to push this? I think, you're, I think you're good. It's the we're green good? light, so okay. we'll take Can it you as hear me? go. Oh, awesome. Thank you. All right, hi, I'm Grace. Um, so it's a short bio. I'm actually from Singapore. I came to Boston five years ago now um, to do grad school. So I did chemical engineering uh, back in Singapore. Came to Boston to do a degree in health sciences and technology. It's a joint PhD program between Harvard and MIT, and I graduated last week which is great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, so that's exciting. Um, but more exciting has been the past one and a half years where I've been organizing a program called Open Style Lab at MIT. And I certainly, you know, I was telling uh, them just now that I don't come in with their years of experience, but I am going to be sharing tonight a really personal story about how I formed Open Style Lab in the past one and a half years. What Open Style Lab is, is a program that's designed to create clothing for people with disabilities. So this means people who are paralyzed or have amputations or arthritis or autism, where they cannot dress independently or they just do not fit into the mainstream clothing that as we wear. So what we're doing right now is teaming up students which are either designers, engineers, or occupational therapists and we match them up with these clients with a disability. And over 10 weeks at MIT, we bring in all sorts of mentors and resources for them, and they prototype a solution for their clients. Um, so really, it's kind of like, you can think of it as an incubator for innovative clothing solutions for this population that has largely been ignored by the fashion industry. Um, fashion industry has, you know, been a lot about the glamour and about looking good, and very few of us start to think about how functionality plays into clothing. How do you button a shirt with one hand? Or how do you put pants on over a prosthetic leg, which is wider than a normal leg? So those are the kind of questions that we're addressing. Thanks. That's great. 
Henry. That's super cool. Hey guys. Are you awake? Yeah. <laughs> cool, it's great to be back in Hanover. My name is Henrik and I had the pleasure of being here last year as well where I met uh, some of you. Uh, we did a two-day startup experience workshop where I took some of you through the entire journey of an entrepreneur in two days. And that's been a big part of what I do. I travel around the world and work with young innovators like yourselves and try to infuse some of that entrepreneurial spirit in young people because uh, that's one of the things that we need and I guess that's all the, also the agenda for tonight mm -hmm. to, uh, to talk about entrepreneurship and how um, you can basically empower yourself to become a successful entrepreneur and go out and solve some of the big problems that we have in the world and hopefully also uh, end up making a lot of money. Um, so that's kind of like my, uh, my hope for, for these uh, the next three days that we're gonna see a lot of great uh, ideas and a lot of, uh, of cool new uh, social startups come out of, uh, of Dartmouth. Uh, my own background, um, I went to, um, to university in Denmark. I grew up in Denmark, a tiny little country up in the northern part of uh, Europe. I moved to Silicon Valley four years ago uh, after kind of having um, gone through five years of studying, uh, engineering, uh, was involved with, I started a couple of companies during my engineering studies uh, one of them, kind of like the first one, was with a social focus, and we can maybe talk about that mm -hmm. a little later. Uh, crashed and burned big time due to uh, some unforeseen co-founder conflicts. Uh, the, the biggest reason that startups fail is actually not because the product doesn't work or because people don't want to buy it. It's because the co-founders can't get along. Um, and in this case, my co-founder turned out to be a corrupt person who uh, stole all the money. Um, so that was an interesting um, experience, and I learned a lot from that. Um, then um, I found another company, uh, Sputnik 5, that I exited before I then went to, uh, to Silicon Valley and have now spent the past four years immersing myself into this uh, very vibrant startup scene that you've probably heard of in Silicon Valley. It's, a, it's an amazing, magical world where there's so many people with great ambitions, great ideas, and they're working super hard to change the world in one way or another. Um, so I thought it would be important to try to take some of those best practices from Silicon Valley and from other ecosystems and bring them to um, basically all the schools uh, around the world. So I spent a lot of time traveling to, um, we've been to about 14 different countries now in five different, on five different continents, uh, doing faculty training, so te teaching teachers how to teach entrepreneurship and working with, the, with students on how to transform problems into opportunities. Um, so I guess, yeah. That's, that's great. A bit of my background, yeah, and I'm, I'm involved in, in a number of different startup projects, as many of you can probably, um, you probably have the same problem. If you have that entrepreneurial mindset, you tend to get involved with a million <clears> things <throat> at a time, uh, so it's kind of hard to focus, um, but uh, I, I try to focus most of my time on, on startup experience for the time being, and then I'm on the side kind of looking at new tech projects yeah. as well. So one thing I would like to do for a moment and get your insights on is, it's, it's create a baseline for the audience mm -hmm. on how you all actually define entrepreneurship and maybe in the spirit of just the discussion tonight, how do you define social entrepreneurship, right? There's definitely excitement around entrepreneurship at a global, on a global scale. Uh, it's definitely increased the past 10 years. Uh, but I, I, I think there is this, this ongoing challenge of how do you actually define it? Is it a skill set? Is it, is it a philosophy? Is it, is it just geared towards for profits? And so I'm just interested in on, on how you all view and define it yourself. So, Grace, do you want to? Sure. Um, so I think I'll go first. So I think of it more as kind of like a process in which you're incentivizing lots of different players such that they can all collaborate to create value. And so in for-profit companies, you're creating value, monetary value. You're creating profit. That's your goal. For social entrepreneurship, I would just say that the only other thing that's added on top of that is there is a social outcome. There's some sort of social value that's created as well. And um, you know, if you look at the difference between just like social innovation versus social entrepreneurship, I would say that the difference is in that entrepreneurship, you're actually capitalizing on the market structure, that it can be sustainable within um, our current society's market structure to survive and sustain by itself. Yeah. Whereas, whereas innovation is slightly whereas different? Whereas in, in innovation, you wouldn't have to, say, capitalize on market structure so much. Yeah. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes those terms, entrepreneurship, innovation, are one and the same or they get blended. 
And I think it's, I think it's, you know, there is a, there is that subtlety. So I'm glad you, glad you mentioned yeah. that, Grace. Henry? You typically need some kind of innovation in order yep. to be a successful entrepreneur. Yep. Um, I guess um, I think of entrepreneurs as, uh, or entrepreneurship as a mindset, right? Entrepreneurs are those who don't just accept the way things are. They don't accept the status quo, but actually want to change things. Either for themselves as an individual, I think the most important startup of all is the startup of you as an individual. Like, what is your personal goal? And uh, Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, wrote a great book called The Startup of You, where he mm -hmm. talks about how you can apply all these principles that you use to accelerate a startup company to your own life and your own career. And that's very relevant uh, sitting, um, as many of you are students and are just about to kind of launch your own career, looking at how can you operate your own career as a startup company? How can you be good at identifying opportunities for yourself? And how can you be good at constantly adapting to that constantly changing environment? You need to update your own skills and not just get stuck in some corporate job doing mm -hmm. the same thing day in and day out. Because at some point that job might not no longer be there and then your school, skills are outdated. So entrepreneurship is a way of kind of living life where you take initiative to do stuff. It takes a lot of curiosity. It takes a lot of um, courage um, to go out and, and go against what everybody else are doing. Um, I think a great example of one of my favorite kind of stories of entrepreneurship, and I think I told you, talked about this last year as well, is this uh, guy from uh, the Philippines who um, created a uh, sort of an entity called a leader of light. How many of you have heard of that? One people, two people, okay. Um, so this young guy, um, uh, Demetrius Bukas, he was uh, an unemployed carpenter living in uh, the rural areas of the Philippines, and he was super poor and he was unemployed, so he didn't have anything to do with his time. Uh, but instead of just sitting on his butt day in and day out, just uh, looking out of the window and being frustrated that he didn't have any money or he didn't you know, get any um, kind of benefits from the state or whatnot, mm -hmm. he started looking for problems that he could uh, solve. And he found out that uh, in the Philippines, um, a lot of people live in these very simple houses. It's like a shack with no windows. Uh, they, don't, they can't afford el electricity. So they're, they're basically no light. So day in and day out, no lights, you can't find your stuff, you're sitting in there in complete darkness. Uh, so instead of just accepting that, he started prototyping and found out that if he takes a, a water bottle and he makes a hole in the top of this shack, he can mount the water bottle into, onto the top and the sun will come in during the day and light up that entire shack. That solution costs less than $2, it can last them more than 10 years and uh, it's lighting up the worlds of, of now millions of people. And that created employment for himself. He has employed like 50 people that are running around and installing these bottles of light all over the, this, uh, this huge community. And, um, and it's frustrating. Uh, and it, I mean, of course, that's great for this guy. And, and now other people have adopted that same model in other places in the world. But if you look at these uh, poor communities, you would see the same kind of living conditions in India, in Latin America, in Africa, um, I've seen it myself, and it's exactly the same situation where people just accept that they don't have light inside, that it's pitch darkness day in and day out, and that's just the way it is. But where this guy kind of had that drive and that entrepreneurial mindset mm -hmm. that he said, I'm not going to accept that that's my world and that's what we should, we should live like that, but actually started doing something, started prototyping. It didn't work at first, but eventually he kind of got it. Uh, and cool. I think that it takes that kind of mindset to to just start doing something, get off the couch and start prototyping um, yeah. with different things. And, and in terms of the definition or the distinction between social entrepreneurship and regular entrepreneurship, um, I think that's a great conversation to have. Uh, I, I, I feel like more entrepreneurs should consider themselves as social entrepreneurs. Because yeah. um, entrepreneurship is about problem solving. And why not try to solve some of the real problems we have in the world instead of creating another angry bird or uh, did you guys see that uh, app that came out called Yo? Yeah. Yeah. Did you see that? How useless is that, right? <laughs> and that guy, he raised a million dollars on an app and the only function, function with that app is that you can send the two letters Yo to somebody, right? A million dollars he raised. Like, and I mean, like, there are so many big problems around the world. Why not try to, uh, to solve some of those? So, so I'm, ju I'm just curious, <laughs> as a, just a show of kind of hands, does most of the audience or has most of the audience thought of social entrepreneurship equal like nonprofit? 
So kind of, I guess, maybe half and half. Yeah. Whereas, whereas I think you guys are all maybe just, it, it's, it's really, again, the, the application of this philosophy or tool set of sorts, entrepreneurship, yeah. to just social big problems that, that, that the world's facing. That can yeah, be that's kind of through, a, through that. Yeah, yeah, if I can yeah. just finish that, because that was actually where I was getting at that all entrepreneurship should be social in self fashion because you're solving a problem. And the bigger the problem, the bigger the opportunity, right? And instead mm -hmm. of wasting your energy, uh, your entrepreneurial energy on, on building another useless game or useless app, try to solve a real problem instead. And you will also make a lot more money and have a lot more impact. Um, and it's now finally starting to get more and more socially acceptable as well to make money while doing something good. It's interesting how this kind of stigma that we have around if you work for a social enterprise or an NGO, you're not allowed to get paid. Mm -hmm. But if you work on Wall Street, some people would argue creating less value <laughs> than uh, working for a, for a nonprofit foundation. It's perfectly fine and it's perfectly acceptable that you're making 500 grand a year, right? Nobody will argue against that. But if, if you're working in a nonprofit or in a social enterprise, trying to solve a real problem for disabled people or whatnot, and you, you're taking out you know, anywhere more than, I don't know, 60, 70K a year, then uh, people will like, whoa, whoa, what are you doing, right? Taking that money that we're donating to you and, and paying yourself for that, that's not what we're in for. Uh, and that kind of mentality will just you know, prevent people who are really talented or the most of the people who are really talented into going into to social projects. So I think that's a shame. Um, so more projects or more startups that do social innovation while also making money, I think that, that's kind of like the way to go. And that's also what we're going to try to do over the next couple of days in the startup experience. We will create for-profit social ventures. So making money while doing something meaningful, doing something good, solving real problems. No, that's great. And, I, and, I, and what really hits me, and, I, and I've heard this a lot just within the overall startup community, is the, the ability to, to or, or the inspiration to tackle and go after really big problems, right, is I think something that hopefully all of you can kind of take today is, is, is that's what I think the world really could use, some of those, those risk takers to go after some of those, those, those bigger problems. Yeah? How would you rate or c compare social innovation, social entrepreneurship to something along the lines of changing culture, for example, sexual assault on campus? We're not talking about like a nifty product or something like that, but actually changing culture. Is, how is that connected? So the challenge with kind of addressing those types of problems is that it's very hard to make money doing stuff like that. Um, so you can set up, you will typically have to set up probably a nonprofit type of entity and get a grant money from a foundation, from a government sponsorship, from universities. Um, but you're not going to make a, a ton of money. Not so that that's as important, but just thinking about that as an entrepreneur, it's um, yeah, it's a, it's a challenge because it's not going to be a probably a very profitable entity. Um, and, and maybe it's not yeah. so much. Maybe I'll challenge it. Maybe it's not so much making money as the potential sustainability of the effort. Right. If if you are really passionate about the effort, you want to kind of sustain the, the the cause and the impact of that, and and that has to be tied to some sort of source to potentially fund the people, fund the, you know, the, the marketing of the effort, etc. Yeah, I think my question to you would be where are the costs in your project? And where do people need to input effort or you know, their resources? And it's about incentivizing all the players in that process so that it becomes a sustainable sort of thing. So it could just be that people are doing it because it's a feel good thing and they want, they have personal experience, they want to share and they, they volunteer their time. I would still say, you know, that's I know this is maybe a difference in opinion, but I would still say in a sense that might com be considered entrepreneurship because you're still creating something new. Absolutely. You're still putting resources together in a new way to create something of value. So I would consider it entrepreneurship. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And it yeah, no, a, yeah, absolutely. Don't, yeah, don't misunderstand yeah. me there. I think it's just a question of if you really are passionate about yeah. it and want to make a change, you, you want that to go as long as possible. Yeah. And you want it to be as, as sustainable as long as possible. Yeah. Let's... Yeah, just yeah, one yeah. kind of comment to add to that whole kind of distinction between what is an entrepreneur and what is a social entrepreneur. And can it be the same? Sometimes, yes. Um, I mean, most of the times it, it takes an entrepreneur to be a good social entrepreneur as well. I guess the difference is that some entrepreneurs who are not socially minded uh, measure success on the bottom line. Whereas if you're a social entrepreneur, 
your key kind of success metrics will be impact potential. Like how mm -hmm. much impact can I create? And if that's your driver, that's your passion, um, then that's phenomenal. And then focus on that. But you're probably going to be strong, struggling a little on the financial side. Um, and then we have this kind of combination, this hybrid where you are a for-profit social venture. So you have a double bottom line. You're looking at like, we need to make money so we can scale up the organization and we need to make impact. And actually here at Dartmouth, we had a really interesting conversation last year because some of the students were like, because uh, after we go through this entire process, we're looking at problems, understanding users, coming up with a good idea f to solve that problem. We need to find a revenue model. We need to look into business model innovation. And some students were like, well, why do we need to do that if we're looking at social entrepreneurship? I, I don't want to make money. That's not my ambition. That's not my driver. That's fine. But if you don't have a sustainable revenue behind your initiative, your impact potential is very limited. You can make a lot of difference for 10, 15, maybe 100 people, maybe 1,000 people in your local community, but you will never get to a million people. You will never get to you know, 500 million people. It's just not going to happen. You need a revenue model behind that that can power this, this, the, the expansion of whatever initiative you're working on. Well, and, 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 and on top of this, there's also just the reality of you have to live, right? And a lot of people, you know, passion can take you so far, the excitement of, of, of launching an initiative yeah. can take you so far, but what typically happens is you, it, it fades away <laughs> because you don't have that really realistic, not even business model, but just sustainability to the, to the, to the effort. That and is I a, think it's really important. Really important, to, yeah. Key, key fact, and I've seen this a number of times that students that have started some kind of social initiative doing their, their studies, and, um, and it's going well, it's kind of slowly growing, they're depending on some grant money or some foundation money or whatever it can be. And then after graduation, they're so excited because now we can devote 100% of our energy to this project, and that's great. And in the beginning, it's, you know, they're super excited, they might have a good team around it, they're creating more and more impact. Uh, but yeah, they just don't have that revenue model figured out, so they can't pay themselves. And yeah, they have all that passion, but to your point, uh, at some point, you know, you see all your fellow students, they, some of them join the evil corporate world, um, and they might work some horrible hours for some project they're not very passionate about, but on the other hand, they're now driving a nicer car, starting to, you know, can afford a better apartment, paying off the student loans a lot quicker, and at some point, you start getting tired of, of living off of nothing. Um, so that's also why I encourage the hybrid model where you actually look at, well, I need to pay myself, and, and why shouldn't you? It's OK to make money while doing something good. <laughs> so we're going to have plenty of time for questions, so I will, we will definitely get to you. But we're, what I really want to focus on now is maybe your individual kind of experiences about bringing resources together to actually bring an idea that you all had actually into action because I think that's if we can give some kind of context into just where you were personally at the time that you actually launched in the endeavor or started thinking about the endeavor I think could give the audience maybe uh, again just some insight into how they're thinking about their own ideas yeah. so so Grace take us back to the problem that you saw and 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 how it wasn't being addressed and and what you kind of brought to it to Okay. To bring things together. Let me first tell the story that I tell everyone about hope and how Open Style Lab came to be, and then I'll tell you a little bit of a more personal background. So what I tell everyone is that during my PhD program, I um, got dumped in a hospital for three months. And so we're all scientists. We work in labs most of the time. But what our PhD program decided to do was to put us in hospitals so that we'll come into contact with real patients and real doctors and real nurses and we'll really see what clinical needs are, what do hospitals actually really need. Um, so they dumped us in the hospital for three months. I know I roamed around, talked to as many people as I could. Um, and the one question that I always asked patients was, what do you miss most about being healthy? And so that became a really important question for me one day when I was speaking to these two women. They both had multiple sclerosis. And interestingly, I noticed that they were both wearing the same thing. I don't know why I noticed it. They were both wearing really starkly plain clothes. And their necklaces, I don't know if you can see, their necklaces weren't like these normal types where they have these like little hooks and clasps that are really difficult to get on. They were these C-shaped bands which you could just clip onto your neck. Mm. And they were both wearing it. I was just like, why are they all wearing the same thing? Because you know they were independent patients. 
And so I spoke to one of the women and I said, what do you miss most about being healthy? Because I wanted to find out what was like the one big problem I could solve for her if there was a big problem that I could solve for her. And she said, she was in a scooter, and she said to me, you know, honestly, not being able to move around anymore isn't that big of a deal. What I really miss is my independence. And so she went on to tell me about how that morning her husband was out of town. And she said, you know, look at me right now. I look put together, and I'm decent, and I'm funny and everything, but you have no idea what I went through this morning to come here to the hospital <laughs> today to meet you. She said, everything I put on today, whatever I used to dress myself this morning is on the floor. And I thought about it. I was like, wow, I never realized that it would be such a big problem. And so after a while, I realized the reason why they were all wearing such starkly plain clothing and you see shaped bands on their neck was because they just didn't have the fine motor skills in their hands anymore to be able to put on a necklace or their bracelet or something like that. And so that started me kind of thinking about the problem of independence in clothing. And you know, all of us are really used to talking about accessibility in the sense of like, you look at a building like that and you look for like, where are the elevators instead of like stairs? And where are the ramps? And are the doors wide enough for a wheelchair to go through? But we don't think about social situations and how the way you dress really determines what events you can participate in in real life, right? If you're going for a date or a concert or someone's wedding or you're going to class or you're coming to speak at a panel, you dress really differently. Like, what would you have thought of me if I showed up in sweatpants or something today, right? Um, although that would have been my first choice, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so the whole point is that accessibility comes into dressing as well. And no one had really addressed it. So that was my short-term reason why I decided to do Open Style Lab. The more personal story behind it is that my, I became aware of beauty and image at a really young age because my sister was born with a cleft palate. And for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that your upper lip is split into two as well as the uh, roof of your mouth. And so you can imagine that people with a cleft palate, they don't look like everyone else. Um, my sister had to go for lots of different surgeries um, at a hospital. She, I think she went for 10 before the age of 16. And there was this one time we were in a hospital and some lady came up to her and said, you know, because you look like that, you're going to have to work ha harder in the future. Which to me was really offensive, first of all. Um, but it was, so, it's, it was so real. It's true that, you know, if you can't present yourself well, you don't have as many opportunities. I've worked with lots of young women over the course of the years as well. That's the other thing that I'm really passionate about, working with youth and women. And um, it's always interesting to me, you see these girls walk into a room and they're really tough and, and they don't want to work with you and stuff. And then you know, you're like, hey, can I you know, help do your hair or your makeup or something? And you do it for them and it softens them so much. The way you look at yourself and your image, it speaks so much to how you feel about yourself. Mm. Um, and it's really empowering. Um, so for me, a very big value in my life is bringing beauty to the people around me. So, you know, that, that's the more of like my values and, and why I went to do this as well, why I focus on this problem when I finally found it. Um, I practically, I talked to a friend about it, Alice. She's my co-chair. I would not have been able to do Open Style Lab without her. I wish she could have been here today to, to share with you guys how this all came together. But I talked to her about it. I think, Henrik, you're so right in saying that the co-founder, the team, is essential. Um, we had a lot of chemistry, but she got excited about it. I got excited about it. To be honest with you, I've had lots of ideas in my life that I've gotten excited about, where I'm like, oh my gosh, this is going to be the next big thing. I'm going to do it. And then it peters out after like 10 minutes, right? But what, <laughs> but what has different here was that with Alice, like I told her about this project, she got excited as well. We decided to do it together, and all of a sudden there was this sense of accountability. All right, we wanted to do it. The sense of accountability was really important for us. Then I was looking around at resources, like what can we do? And we found this community service grant at MIT. Um, it was due the next day. <laughs> so I pulled an all-nighter, stayed up, and wrote this entire grant, 10-page grant for it. Um, kind of, you know, like, there were lots of things that I didn't know I was going to do until I wrote it out on a piece of paper. 
And then we got the money for it, like a month later. And we're like, oh my gosh, we have the money. Now we have to do it. <laughs> and it became real. Um, so, you know, that's, that's how it kind of progressed. Um, and so just in the course of the last year, I would say I went into this not knowing much about the fashion industry, not knowing much about disability at all, um, not knowing much about the design field. Um, but for me, I think a really big thing was learning how to learn, like knowing how to learn, um, and being able to just ask people for help. And it's amazing, like, when you have something that's going to create social value, how much people want to help you. It's like, don't be afraid of asking for help. Just, like, email someone. I cold emailed, like, hundreds of people. And it's amazing, like, I would say 75% of them replied, and I would be able to get a coffee with them and just pick their brain about stuff. And then when they replied, they would they'll be like, oh, your idea is so cool. You know, you should go talk to these other people. And that's how we kind of build up a network around it. Don't expect to get 75% <laughs> reply, though, because that doesn't happen. Wow, I, you I must be extraordinarily like... good at writing <laughs> cold emails. Great emails. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, um, I, I, d I never did the statistics. I should probably go back and look at how many of cold emails I did send. Um, that was amazing. Uh, what was also amazing for me was, I think, just using the resources, having MIT as a name. And I would say at Dartmouth, you guys have the same thing here. Like, you know, it's a big name. Like, use it. <laughs> People would love to say, yeah, I'm working with some students at Dartmouth to create this new venture. Yeah, it sounds great for them. So, you know, go for it. Um, what else? Um, I think something that Jamie touched on earlier when we were talking even before this was the, the readiness to fail. And I've been doing my PhD for the past five years. A PhD to me does not teach you anything than how to fail well. You do science and like all the 90% of our experiments fail. They never go as planned. And you have to just like cobble some sort of value out of it. Like what, what can I learn from this failed experiment? You know, and then you, you feel bad about yourself for a day after it fails. And then the next morning you get it, you do it again. You change something about it, you do it again. Um, and so going into Open Style Lab, there was also this kind of you know, mindset, you know, if this doesn't go anywhere and it fails, hey, I'll still have learned how to kind of be an entrepreneur, right? Like, I'll still have learned how to cold email people, um, learned how to write grants, learned how to get money. Um, so, yeah, that was my mindset going into it. I'm glad it hasn't failed so far. <laughs> um, it doesn't look like it's about to. Really excited about it, but yeah, awesome. maybe I'll stop here for now. That's great. W what types of, of uh, clothing are you? focus on primarily? Um, so also so we have, we're doing a bracelet for someone who has cataplexy. That means she loses control over her muscles so all of a So as a jewelry, not as a functional piece? but Jewelry yeah. and functional. Okay. That will be able to alert people around her to the condition that she has, but only when she falls. Um, pants for people in wheelchairs. So people who are paralyzed often lose control over their bladders, so they have to catheterize themselves like every two hours. And so if you just have like normal genes, um, it's really hard to access the proper areas of your anatomy with the, the type of zippers that you have. Um, so zipper placement is really important. I talked a little bit about prosthetics just now um, and um, how for a lot of people, their prosthetic legs or arms are usually wider than the actual pen legs that um, are, are sewn into mainstream pants. Uh, someone else with a prosthetic arm, every time he puts his hand into a winter coat, he has to wrap a plastic bag around his prosthetic hand so it doesn't get caught in the sleeve when he's putting it on. And another thing about entrepreneurship, I would say um, looking for the problems that you can solve, look at where people are like hacking out solutions. Like a plastic bag is a hack and it doesn't have to be like that. You can design something better than that so that they don't have to use a plastic bag. So I'm gonna jump in, Grace, because I think that's one of the biggest insights that I've just taken from your story is you know, you're a scientist used to the lab, you're thrown into the situation where you're working at a hospital, but you start asking questions of potential like users and customers. And I think sometimes the biggest problems that you know, early stage entrepreneurs have is around idea generation. They kind of create an idea or a new venture within kind of the confines of their own world. And they actually never ask users or see real world problems that, that could be solved. And, and I know, Henrik, and I would love you to speak to this, 
you know, part of the startup experience, one of the core principles is like, hey, before you write that line of code, before you build that widget, whatever, why don't you go bring it to users and see what the feedback is, even if it's just in the idea, the, the idea stage. And I think it's just fabulous that, that you began to just talk to people, right, real human beings, and just ask them, you know, what are some problems that you're having in your daily lives? And then you kind of internalize that and begin to kind of build a venture from, you know, real world data. Yeah, definitely. One of the, the key things as an entrepreneur is to f make sure you're actually dealing with a real problem. Uh, tomorrow we'll talk about the difference between interesting problems and important problems. Because there are a lot of interesting problems in the world that you think are important to people, but they're really not. And if you set out to start a business on solving an interesting problem, you're going to have a much, much harder time selling that to people because people are not willing to pay money for a solution to an interesting problem. Another way I've always heard of is needs versus wants. Yeah. Right? yeah. Does somebody just want it or they, do they really need it, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah, and th there's a... There's a lot of startups who think they have identified a really important problem, but it really isn't. And then one of the key factors, and that's what this whole lean startup methodology that some of you might have heard of. How many people have heard about lean startup? How many people have read the book Lean Startup? Okay, so a few people. Um, but that's, that's one of the new kind of really big buzzwords in entrepreneurship education. Everything has to be lean and you don't have to be skinny. As not to burn. <laughs> That's not what it is about, but it comes from lean manufacturing where you try to cut out all the elements that are not creating real value. So you want to basically iterate and, and another buzzword where you call pivot. It's basically changing direction based on what you've learned. So you want to iterate and, and as quickly as possible get to that product market fit with your startup company. Uh, so you want to pivot based on what you learn when you talk to co customers. But one of the really key things as first, for first-time entrepreneurs is that you overcome that fear of failing uh, and overcome that fear of talking to people about your idea. Because there's a pretty high chance that people are going to say when you present your idea that it sucks. It's not useful. I'm not interested in that. It's not a real problem for me. There's no way that I would pay money for this piece of crap, right? And it's extremely disappointing. And it, and well, it is because you, you probably hear it all the time. It's like these startups are like your children, right? They're like your baby. Yeah. And you don't want your baby to be called ugly. Yeah. No one does. <laughs> but, but that's you, what happens. But you know what's <laughs> the only thing that's worse than going out and talking to people about your idea and realizing that it's stupid is that if you spent a year building that thing and then finally going up from your basement office and presenting this brilliant invention to the world and nobody cares. That really sucks, right? Um, so, so as quick, uh, you know, as as quickly as possible, go out and talk to as many people as possible. Don't be afraid that anybody's going to steal your idea. <coughs> Ideas are cheap. Mm -hmm. It's execution that matters. I'll guarantee you that nobody what I what kind of idea you have, there are a thousand other people with that exact same idea, and it doesn't matter, right? What matters is execution, <coughs> and you can execute much better if you go out and talk to people. And, and just to give you real yeah. concrete, like that could be as simple as like some duct tape together Absolutely. prototype or here's a PowerPoint video that I put together and is it resonating with you? It yeah. doesn't have to be tens of thousands of dollars invested in a, you know, a plastic manufactured prototype. Right? You want to avoid that because you don't know if the market's actually going to pay for it. Yeah. So Again, as part of this whole kind of lean startup methodology is that you need to ship very quickly. You need to build a really crappy prototype and then you ship that out to customers, you see how they react. And you, wanna be, you need to be embarrassed about that first version of your product. If you're not embarrassed about the first version, you waited too long. It's kind of hard to understand. But if you're not embarrassed about it when presenting it to people, you waited too long. Okay? It has to be buggy. It shouldn't have all the great features, all the great design elements. It's a rough prototype, and then that's enough to go and get valuable feedback from the market. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's bring it back to maybe your story. <laughs> yeah. I don't know which startup experience you maybe actually want to refer well, to I, I, outside I guess, of the startup experience. Yeah. But pick one and, and give us a little sure. insight into the so, problem that you saw. Yeah. So I always wanted to be an entrepreneur in some capacity, even before I kind of really understood what that was. But I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to have the independence to kind of do whatever I wanted and to work on, on fun things that I came up with. So first semester, undergrad student, Yes, want to be an entrepreneur. I found a, 
a classmate of mine who was a little bit older, he had a little bit of experience, he already had a, a company that I thought was going okay. Um, so, so I guess he must be a good kind of person to partner up with. And I've also, also always been very fascinated and very passionate about education. Because I think you know education is uh, such a cornerstone in, in societies all over the world and it's such an important thing for any kind of development. And that's why all these tyrants and all these people that are trying to suppress people, you know, eliminate all education, don't want to allow education for girls. Uh, because when people get educated, they, they want to revolutionize things and they, they come up with new ideas and they become very dangerous. Um, so I'm passionate about education, and one of the things that I saw at the time uh, as first semester undergrad student was that a lot of uh, educational institutions in uh, Eastern Europe and in developing countries couldn't afford IT equipment. And in order for them to get good access to proper education, that would be an important thing. So um, myself and, and this uh, gentleman from my, my class uh, we kind of set out on this mission and we identified that, well, there was a big problem with people that couldn't access IT equipment because it was too expensive. And then at that time in Denmark, um, we have a fairly well-funded public sector and all the kind of schools were getting rid of a lot of computer equipment, perfectly well-functioning computers <coughs> and, and you know, IT equipment. Uh, and the same happened with um, you know, public institutions that were, at the time they were kind of merging. So offices were closing down and they were kind of merging everything, so a ton of computer equipment. And also for big companies, when they shift out their co computer equipment, what typically happens is that they just destroy it. Because they're so concerned that somebody will get you know, a hold of those hard drives and they would uh, you know, steal the data. And they don't know how to delete those hard drives in a proper way, so they just throw them away. Um, but actually, these computers are perfectly functional and could work very well in a classroom anywhere else on the world, in the world. So, um, so we figured out a way that, it, and it's actually quite costly for these institutions to get rid of and to destroy that computer equipment. So we figured out a way to uh, basically get the best formatting software. Let's get it a little nerdy, but a way to delete all the content on these hard drives and send those certificates <coughs> back to that school or back to that company. So we could guarantee that the hard drives were completely wiped out. So they would actually pay us to come and collect all that IT equipment and then we could format the hard drives and then we could resell that computer equipment at a super discounted rate to schools uh, in, in developing countries and, and Eastern Europe. Uh, so we thought that was kind of cool and we got the first order and uh, you know, as you know, undergrad students were really excited, it was about $30,000, it was like a lot of money. So we hired some student workers, we rented a big truck and you know, drove over across Denmark, it's not a very big country, but still it took like <laughs> four or five hours. <laughs> and then all night kind of you know, grabbed all these computers into the truck, drove back and then the night and weekends we were kind of working to delete all these hard drives and finally sold them and shipped them off to, I think it was Lithuania over in Eastern Europe. Uh, very, very excited. Great, and we got that money into the bank, and I was really excited because now we could finally afford, you know, a better, uh, you know, location where we could ramp off the ramp up the the whole production and all that. Unfortunately, uh, I kept bugging my my co-founder for what happened to this money, right? Um, so c can we start <laughs> investing now? Can we sign this lease now? And he kind of avoided me. Uh, so at some point, I had to confront him and like, what happened to this money, right? Because we did the first deal in his company because it was already set up. And then after we got the money, I thought we could then establish an entity where we had 50-50 ownership. Unfortunately, the money was gone. Uh, it turns out that he was already bankrupt with this entity, uh, with his company, and that he owed a ton of money to the bank and to other investors and to other clients of his. Um, so it ended up in a bad lawsuit and he got kind of kicked out of the university. And yeah, I learned the hard way that you, you want to find people to work with that have uh, integrity. Right? We're going to talk more about the co-founders you know, co and the founding team of a startup, what's important. There are kind of three factors, intelligence, drive, and integrity. And which one is more important? Integrity, right? Because if, if people don't have integrity, you don't want them to have a lot of drive and a lot of intelligence, because they're going to screw you over, <laughs> essentially, right? So, uh, so yeah, that was um, a hard way to learn that. But uh, so then it took another, I don't know, a year or so after that, I was slightly depressed. And yeah, well, I learned a lot from it. Um, fortunately, I didn't lose too much money. It was more like a lot of time I committed to it, right? Um, but then I founded another company and that was actually a consulting business around uh, systematic creativity and design thinking. 
Um, and I was then, I don't know, fourth semester undergrad or something like that. We had one semester where we learned something about creativity. And then we were kind of, uh, a couple of classmates of mine were like self-proclaimed uh, creativity experts. Um, because then there was a company nearby, um, a nice little company called Siemens. <laughs> Um, and uh, our teachers told us that there aren't a lot of companies that are good at being creative. So we wanted to test that hypothesis. So we went out to Siemens through uh, you know, a connection that we had and, and asked them, so do you know anything about creativity or would you like to learn some more? And they said, yeah, we, we would like that. <laughs> Excellent, because we happen to be experts in design thinking and systematic creativity. Uh, why don't you hire us as consultants so we can come out and, um, and they did. <laughs> I don't know why. But they did, and then we were like, just like in your situation, like, whoa, what do we do now, right? We had no idea. So, you know, reading the books again and finding out a way to put together this two days uh, strategy uh, <laughs> development workshop where we're supposed to run this uh, in using creativity and, uh, and, and for basically 25 project managers at Siemens. And we're like these fourth semester undergrad students, but it went really well. And they ended up rehiring us, and, um, and then we got Siemens as the first client for our new consulting business. And that was pretty good. That's so cool. uh, that was a fun yeah, kind of student awesome. job. It's <laughs> called fake it till you make it. Exactly. Fake it till you make it, absolutely. And that has been my philosophy basically throughout the, the startups that I've created. The same with startup experience. My first client was uh, Intel. And when I went on the call with this guy from Intel, I had nothing. I'm not sure this is good to actually say on video, but uh, it's real. We like it. <laughs> but I had nothing, absolutely nothing. So I totally faked it on that call. That oh yeah, we totally have this. We have a lot of experience in this, and yeah, we can absolutely do this. And then it's like okay, let's do a pilot project, and then back to the drawing table, and then actually building it. So if you can sell it before you build it, that's phenomenal. That's the ultimate proof of concept, right? People are willing to pay you money for an idea, then you have something. That's great. Grace, I'm curious, I mean, you're at this really kind of early stage still. Tell me more how you're thinking about like your own future. Are you, is this something that you're thinking about scaling and really growing and working on full time? Are you torn between how do you balance it once you mm. kind of get out of, I guess, the, 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 the bubble of higher ed or the... Or yeah, the absolutely. Um, I think I can identify with a lot of you here, like I'm just, up to a year ago, I saw myself as a regular student, scientist, you know, nowhere near like being an entrepreneur, never really wanted to be one very much either. Um, I would say that uh, the way I think about it right now, I've given myself a year to just go into this full time and to just devote everything to it after graduation. That's my plan um, and to see where it's going to go. Um, and for me, it's nice to have these boundaries to say, all right, you know what? I'm giving myself this time to just take a risk. And it doesn't matter what happens. I'm just going to take a risk and see what happens with it. Um, we do have potential investors to scale the program up, basically. Um, so this is actually formed? Like you have an entity or? Yeah. Um, okay. okay. So let me explain a little bit more. Um, because this all came together so fast and we needed a structure to hold Open Style Lab and to receive funding and everything, we decided to uh, work out of MIT right now. Mm -hmm. So in fact, we're working out of a student club. And it's great because MIT gives us a ton of resources. We don't have to rent any space. We have equipment at MIT that we can use. We have all the administrative stuff there. Um, so that's all settled for us. And so. I feel that being at school is one of the best places to experiment with things. You have so many resources already put together for you here. Um, and then, to be honest, on my worst days, do I think about, you know, do I worry about being an entrepreneur? Yes, absolutely yes. On my worst days, I think, why can't I just be like everyone else and have a secure job and work for somebody where someone else gets to worry about how I'm paid rather than I worry about how I'm paid? You know, um, but as I said, um, I think what keeps me going most of the time is just the uh, thought that, you know, this is what I'm be meant to do for this year and I'm going to do it as well as I can and I'm going to see where it goes. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think if you guys are okay, I think we're going to yeah, just to that point. Jump into um, some Q&A. You got one more point? Yeah, just very <laughs> One more point and then we'll jump into Q&A. <laughs> Surprise. You're persuasive. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I totally agree that there will never be a better time than now to start a business. You think you're busy, but you're not, right? You can always find more time. You still have tons of extra energy to work nights and weekends on side projects. You have all these resources. You have the brand of the university. You can go out as students. 
you know, and, and you can get in access to any company in the world and they will want to tell you about their problems. They want to tell you because it's like innocent. You're not a salesperson calling them. You're a student from Dartmouth, right? It opens so many doors. So it's an amazing opportunity. You should really take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, timing wise, start now. It's uh, the best time ever. Absolutely. Well, let's jump into Q&As. I'm going to ask for when we do raise the hands, just ask for the mic and wait for the mic so we can get it on the video. Yes, you in the, the corner there. <clears throat> Hi. It's not a really question. I just want to thank you. You are giving me hope because it's like I'm, I start my own uh, company and it's like you are I'm worried about how I'm going to pay myself. I don't have a car. I don't have a house. And, and even like that, I want to continue because I don't want to. Uh, I want to be my self-employed. And uh, the way that you are talking about I was identify. I wasn't. I was identifying everything with mo all my problems that I was I'm having, and then even like that, you are here presenting this. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Who else? Thanks. Yes, right there. Uh, <coughs> um, I, I'm 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 bit in dilemma, so I will need <coughs> a bit of your um, input in this. As an entrepreneur. Um, there, there is um, two things. You either uh, di diversify, like try all opportunities, or try to concentrate, uh, focus on, 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 on one area. So which way is better? <laughs> so just to repeat the question, I think it's a question of, do you, as an entrepreneur, are you looking to shotgun approach and try a whole bunch of opportunities in front of you? Or do you maybe try to focus on one and, and see how far it can go? Yeah. Grace? Oh. Okay. Or, or Henrik, if you're, if you're ready to go. Um, well, my question to you is that if you're an entrepreneur, you're taking a lot of risk. Um, it has to be something that you feel is worth taking a risk for, right? And so if you're trying lots of things, is that just because your motivation is to come up with something that makes money, which, by the way, is not a bad motivation? Um, but if it can be more than just making money, if it actually means something to you, which I doubt is all of those 10 things that you're trying, then yes, I think you should you know, stick to that one thing that means the most to you because at the end of the day, that's going to be like a huge part of your motivation as well. Yeah. Henry? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. You, if you're in it for the money, you know, drop whatever you're doing and go to Wall Street. It's a much better way to make money. Nine out of 10 startups that actually receive an A round of funding, so very you know, intelligent investors putting in money into their startups, nine out of 10 of those companies will still fail, or they won't make it big at least. You know? So it is very unlikely that you're gonna make a lot of money as an entrepreneur. Mm. That should not be the main motivation. Uh, so yeah, definitely, that, that's but, an important but, point. However, yeah. um, and, and to your question, uh, it is a, a challenge that I think most entrepreneurs, if not all entrepreneurs, faces. Like, what should I put my energy into, right? And as you can hear, I'm also this kind of octopus. I'm involved with numerous projects, but I try to focus most of my time on one thing. And you need focus. But one of the, of the kind of crucial skills and what defines a founder is that you can be persistently agile which is kind of, you know, contrary, uh, two contrary things. Um, but in the sense that you don't want to give up the first time somebody tells you that your idea sucks, right? If, if that was the case, then nobody will ever, would ever succeed, right? Because you need to have that confidence and that persistence um, to, to continue working on ideas, even though people think it's stupid and they don't get it. Most companies were started that way. However, if you've talked to a thousand potential customers and none of them like the idea, you might want to, you know, <laughs> rethink at least certain components and start, you know, be, be more agile and adapting to whatever market you're, you're looking into. Uh, so it is, it's a very, you're probably not going to like that answer, right? But it, it's a difficult I, balance. Yeah, and, out and I do think you have to be very, enough, yeah. very careful around this notion that ideas are a dime a dozen. It really does result in the ultimate execution. And from personal experience, the first time I ever launched my first startup and you hit that first challenge, that's when all the other ideas you've ever had start pouring in. And you think, you know, why am I wasting my time on this thing when this thing's so much better? 
and it isn't, right? It's just you've hurt, hit that first obstacle and you have to kind of be persistent and focused. So yeah. I do think focus is a really critical element to the startup journey. Andrew. So I have a, a question. It relates to the one that was just asked about a little bit of diversification. And the example is, Grace, when you speak about the projects that you're working on, you tend to give us very hard problems. Custom, not a very big market. But, and I use this advisedly because I hate the jargon, but you have a potential disruptive technology. Because now when I think about these issues, well, I don't have any of these conditions, so I don't need those clothes. Fine. But if you reframed it in the way you described it as, I'm gonna make clothes or assistive technology that is so easy to use that even people who are facing physical challenges can wear it and look good, that doesn't preclude me as someone who's not currently suffering from one of these ailments from using it. And so I sort of think that, and I presume you're doing this, but I think you're gonna have several things that emerge from your lab that have a larger market than just those who are facing physical challenges now. Oh. And you will achieve scale, you will make money, and then you will use that to cross-subsidize what's really got you going, which are these really hard problems, like the prosthetic limbs, uh, the folks who need the catheterization, uh, and, and the like. Right. And so I think embedded in lots of business ideas is this notion that you have to find a cross-subsidy. You have to find something that makes you the money so you can transfer it uh, to the things that really drive the creativity. Yeah, thanks for well, pointing that out. Well said. And I think that goes around the, this business model reality, right? It's may, and, and maybe you haven't hit this yet, but once you get to a point where you say, how am I gonna sustain myself, my team, the people around me, maybe that's when you start taking into consideration how can I broaden the scope because my initial market is just way too small. I see. Yeah, in fact, if I may just address your point, cause, which I completely agree with, one of the things we tell our students is to focus on universal design, which means that you, you're designing, yes, for people with disabilities, but it's even better when you're designing for all people, including people with disabilities, because then your market like, expands to everyone. And one of the best products that has come out recently that completely jives with this whole principle of universal design is called the MagZip. I don't know how many of you here are consumers of Under Armour, but Under Armour just licensed it. MagZip is basically, you know how like when you're using a zip on your jacket, you kind of have to fiddle with it to like insert the bottom part before you can pull it up? So it takes out that whole fiddling part. It's a magnet, it just, you, you simply bring it together and it That's clicks awesome. together and then you just pull it out with one hand. So anyone with even just one hand can use a zip. Now the people who first designed it was an occupational therapist and an engineer designing for their brother who had a disability and had only one hand to use. But obviously when Under Armour saw it, they were like, whoa, anyone can use this technology. This is awesome. Like, you know, you're out skiing, you don't want to take off your, take off your gloves to like, you know, do up that zip thing. You just use the mag zip instead. And so right now they're doing That's it cool. for all of Under Armour's stuff. They're doing it for, I believe, um, these covers for boats and yachts and things like that, anything that's like hard to zip, basically. And so, yeah, it's a great principle. Thank you so much for, yeah. Would you, would you recommend people doing this straight out of school? I mean, it strikes me that liberal arts education is wonderful for creativity. You can imagine things. But when you get out in the real world, you've got to hire people, you've got to fire people, you've got to set budgets, you've got to do marketing, you've got to deal with innumerable vendors, and there's lots of terrible lawyers and architects and HVAC contractors and you name it out there. Would it not be better to finish school and go work in a real job for a couple of years, possibly a small business where you see all sorts of sides of things, and then go out and, as you said, execute on these wonderful ideas? Because it is true that it's the execution that's the toughest. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And uh, especially people who um, have graduated school for as some young, some for some years ago, um, tend to get frustrated because they hear all about these young entrepreneurs that are fresh out of college or drop out of college to start these multi-billion dollar companies. Um, but to be fair, um, 
is very few of those uh, college kind of grad students that end up founding successful companies. It's just a few amazing success stories that we focus on all the time. The average age of uh, entrepreneurs that actually build a real company that is profitable is around 40. Um, so it's, it's not these you know, 20-something entrepreneurs that sit in a dorm room and hack on some random thing that typically make it. So yeah, that, that can be a good point. And I think mo so most of those companies that actually you know, turn out to become profitable uh, are from people that have been in an industry, understand the industry, have the network, and really see you know, a, a great need in that industry and can, um, based on that experience and that network and that knowledge, then come up with a with a new idea on how to disrupt um, that particular industry. So yeah, that, that it can be either way, but I think I mean the sooner the, you start, the better, because um, you will start building up some of that entrepreneurial confidence and and the more times you train yourself into doing customer validation, talking to potential users of your product. Uh, it is a skill that you can train and you can get better and better and better. And the more you practice, the more you learn, the better you get. So then when you see a real opportunity and you m might do this, you know, side by side with, with having a full time job, you start experimenting with different things. And then when the time comes, because you've, you know, failed with, I don't know, seven different projects uh, along the, the time as side projects, you have the expertise to, to really execute well when that idea comes up. But yeah, age is, is really not a, um, a barrier, either being too young or too old. Um, but I would say, yeah, it, it can definitely be an advantage to understand an industry well. Um, you talked about the importance of finding a co-founder that you can work well with, especially since like you can work off from each other, give each other energy. What advice would you give to like you know find someone that you know you can work really well and even like assemble a team that can execute the startup? What about on, on how to find those people? or how to evaluate whether they're yeah, the right fit. Like, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a really tricky thing, right? Because one of the things, we, we'll talk more about the startup um, team formation and, and figuring out how to have, you know, have co-founders that have drive, intelligence, and... Integrity. Integrity, right? <laughs> Most importantly. And so know that you're working with people that you can trust, uh, but also people who have complementary skill sets. And that's one of the key things. A lot of people, you know, found a company with their classmates uh, and that can be good because you're on the same page, you have the same kind of thinking, you might have gone through the same experience, so it's very easy to relate to each other and you're best friends and all that stuff. However, it might not be the best for the startup because in order to have a good founding team, and a founding team shouldn't be very big. A founding team, the ideal size of a founding team is around three, three co-founders, three or four. Um, and in that, you know, little team, you should have a good representation of many different skills. In every startup team, you need a hacker, a hustler, and an artist. A hacker to focus on technology, a hustler to figure out the business side, and an artist to focus on user design, user experience, and the whole kind of front end of the business. Um, so, so it's a tricky thing to find out those people. And then secondly, of course, you need to work together, being able to communicate effectively inside that startup team is really key and a lot of people underestimate the importance of being able to communicate effectively in the team. Uh, one of the best things to do uh, if you have people that you think you want to work with is to participate in one of these startup weekend events or like a startup experience type of, of event where you go through a very intense process where you have to work on solving a problem and you're under a lot of constraints on a lot of time pressure. Then you really get to work with each other and see how people act under stress um, or work on, if you have that side project, uh, then work, you know, commit weekends and, and nights during the week and, and try to work hard. Then you will figure out if they're as committed as you are. Um, and then when you form that entity and you decide to start a company, you want to have a vesting schedule. <laughs> and now we're getting a little technical, but that essentially means that you don't own the equity, the stocks of your company from day one. If you're four co-founders, it's very tempting to say, hey, the best way to split this company is 25% to each. Because we're all really passionate about it. We already want to work hard. But guess what? After See you, Henrik. Year, I'm going to Wall Street. Thanks for my 25%. <laughs> exactly, yeah. That's what I, yeah. And then you're out of here. Yeah. And now we have a company where 25% of our, of our stock, of our activity, is passive. It's not, he's not working with us anymore. But we can't do anything because he owns that 25%. 
that, that you basically have to close down that company because no investor would invest in a startup where 25% of the equity is passive. It's just not going to happen. So very important to not have, you know, just divide that equity from day one, but have a vesting schedule, meaning that you own, earn that equity up over time. And if, within the first six months or within the first year, nobody has any equity. But after a year, you finally actually start owning that equity. But that, that means that you don't when after that year and you feel like one of the partners is actually down to working half time because now he had a, a baby or whatnot and another partner is is only working you know 85 percent because he also wants to do another project uh, and then you can divide the equity you know fairly um so that, that's that's it's a tricky thing you know figuring out how co-founders work well um but the, the equity structure is definitely important and that's a root yeah. for many many startup teams that break up and I would just add as a, as a plug to incubators and our new innovation center, I mean, these are the power of these, these environments as they really become a hub. And when done correctly, the people that actually occupy those environments are very diverse, right? So you'll have technical oriented people, business oriented people, yep. the artistic, liberal arts oriented people. And that's the, that, those are the environments that you all want to put yourselves in because you don't know who you'll get introduced to or who you'll bump into to either start a venture or bring on a team member. So I think that's really critical for you all to be on the, on the lookout for those types of groupings uh, because you can really find really good people there. Yeah. Grace, did you have a comment? Or? Just one oh, Yeah, comment. go for it and then we'll. Um, I just wanted to say that I don't think that having a good relationship with co-founders or teammates is that different from having a good relationship with anyone. Um, one of the key principles that Alice and I had while being co-founders was that if there's a really tiny issue, we had to talk about it before it. It's really easy to kind of like pretend that nothing is wrong and just keep going sometimes until like things kind of build up. Um, and so to give you an example that's kind of embarrassing for me, but I think it's helpful. Alice and I usually take meetings together, which means that we both are present when we meet a new investor or a new partner or something like that. And she's a little bit more outgoing than I am, and so she would tend to talk more. And it started to bug me, it really did. And I was like, why is she getting so much talk time at these meetings? And like, I'm not getting to talk at all, you know? What if they think it's all her idea, when really it's a lot of my idea? And so there are a lot of these like selfish motivations that just come out when you're working with someone so closely every single day and it's stressful, right? Um, and so this is a conversation that I had to have with her, you know, just talk it out and be like, hey, Alice, do you think like maybe like I just feel that I'm not getting, well, I feel like sometimes I'm not being credited a lot, which is really embarrassing, right? To be so vulnerable with someone. Mm -hmm. But I think really that's how you build trust with people and it's the same way in any relationship. Yeah. That's really well said. Yeah, it, it, sure. it's, you see it more often than not, so you're not alone, <laughs> trust me. I had a question up there. Yes, um, it's more of a comment than a, um, a question um, before I say anything. My name is Kulegani Msweli, and I'm from the kingdom of Swaziland. And I direct um, and own a design company, which has its core emphasis in fashion and furniture and art. So primarily, it's within a high-end bracket. And it's been interesting um, discussing the issues of um, social entrepreneurship, um, because my company in a way, it started out of my own passion of, you know, and values in life, the things I like, I enjoy, and believe in. But as the years have gone on, um, it's more or less directed itself into incorporating a social element, which was not the core, really, emphasis of it. But in how I've conducted it, it has become quite social in that just to make um, an example whereby, um, and also to probably remove a certain notion where um, from mainly being in a high-end fashion environment where it's considered a lot of time to be, it's an industry where, yeah, we create amazing products, but what? But there's so much which um, goes on, which I've realized with my company where for example, we make um, accessories, for example, the one I'm wearing, which is made out of jac uh, jacaranda trees. And jacaranda trees in Swaziland are an alien species. So when I started um, coming up with concepts of um, an accessory line, 
I looked at the env environmental issues within the country. And the trees were, you know, the alien invasive species were quite an issue. And then we also have a huge issue on litter. And so some of the products we create um, take on those environmental issues. The handbags are fully recycled, incorporating great leather, but with a lot of recycled plastic within it. So all those things ended up bringing in this social dynamic of eradicating certain issues which relate to the environment, yet also providing quite a number of jobs. Because what I discovered with a lot of the artisanal um, um, crafters I work with, wood, it, it's a profession in, in terms of the wood carvers and the women who create intricate beadwork that I work with would, wouldn't be working, continuing with that profession because not many people were designing desirable or convertible products mm. utilizing their skill. So my company has been able to sustain certain industries which would be diminishing through mass production and mm -hmm. just having products which are more disposable to make more profit out of them. So yes, we create high-end you know, products which are for a specific niche market, um, yet the dynamics of where the money goes to becomes very social and very desir desirable to even our clients. So I've seen quite a great growth in our clients because of the story of what the products have been coming in um, from. And just to comment on the issue of um, disabled clothing, it's interesting because you know when you mentioned it, um, my dad um, um, uses a pro prosthetic limb through his right arm. He lost it in 1979. But he, um, he takes on a different approach, though. Um, he's the type of person who, um, luckily, he's been able to have things custom made, and his pro prosthetic limb is really amazing. You know, he has one, some of the best prosthetic doctors available. So he doesn't have much problem in terms of, for example, you mentioned putting the hand with plastic. Um, and through design, having a son who more or less designs, he's always mentioned the issue of you know, clothing. But to him, it's always been an issue where he doesn't want anything which will make him so noticeable that the item is so different from mainstream. So it's always been that balance of getting it right. So luckily, yes. Unfortunately, it doesn't have to have so many things custom made, but it is a relevant issue and one which I think has great potential when done right. Great point. Thanks. Great story. Thank well, you for sharing that. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Yeah. You got I'll, a, a I'll use the mic since it's right next to me. <laughs> Go for it. Um, have any of you had experiences with, um, you, you talk about, um, let's say, finding the, the client's uh, problem and then creating a solution for that. Is there, or do you teach um, the concept of seeing if someone else has already created a solution? Because um, the, the industry I work in, I'm not the inventor of the original product. I just thought it would be better for our market than it was for theirs. And, uh, and that's why we got started. So I'm not necessarily an, an innovator, but I... I contribute to the, to the new ideas, but it's a thing of, um, like you'll see something and you're like, that is really cool. That'll, be, that'll work well in, in Asia because of X, Y, Z. So you go and speak to them. Um, what, what part, do you have any part in your process where you actually educate people on, on, on that, on looking for? Yes, on, on, on customer development. is kind of like the umbrella term for all the different aspects of how to interview customers and how to validate whether or not you have identified a real problem. And so kind of like the first part of that process is going out and talking to 100 people that you think have this particular problem. So you think you've understand, you, you understand who are the users for this potential product and who are the people who experience this problem. Then you go out and you try to f figure out, can you validate or invalidate whether or not this hypothesis that you, you have an assumption that this is a problem for a specific type of, of people. So you figure out whether or not that is a real problem. And then secondly, you start building what's called a minimum viable product or the first kind of rough prototype as we talked about. And then you go out and you test how people react to that. 
So that's the second kind of uh, way to, to structure these customer development interviews. And there's a whole kind of science around how to identify the right people to talk to. Do you want to go and talk to your, your parents or your neighbor? Or false your, positives. Or, exactly. <laughs> you get a ton of false positives, right? Because people want to please other people. So when you talk to someone that you know, people are not going to be honest. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a really great project. I would totally buy that. No, they wouldn't. <laughs> at all, right? I mean, when you talk to customers, a yes typically means a no. When people ask, where can I buy it? That means maybe. If people say, hey, take my money. Take my money right now. I want it right now. That's a yes, right? That's a big yes. But a yes <laughs> is a no. And so, so it's a ch difficult thing how to structure those interviews, how to identify the right people to talk to, and how to not set up you know, a, way, a questionnaire or, or asking the questions in a very leading way. Also, all these kind of hypothetical questions like, would you buy this kind of project? Would you pay this much? It's useless. So, so the Just, whole different way of, and we, we'll talk about that, how to structure those interviews. But I think it's a valid point. So, so I, would, I would comment just by saying, I don't think innovation is just around the product or the good you're, you're, you're building. I think innovation can occur around the business model and that, how do you actually go to market? And a perfect example, I mentioned to you, I started out of college an educational software company. And this company was based around audience response systems. So this was big in corporate America where you all would have a little clicker device and you would give the presenter like A, B, C, or D. And I brought that into higher ed. So this was around 2000, where students could provide real-time feedback to their presenter. How we actually went about selling that was a very typical standard way. You would go to a department and you would sell seat licenses. There was another company that came along and said to the professor, hey, you know, would you like to try this? Maybe I could try it once or whatever, but I don't want to pay you for it. And they said, it's okay, you don't have to pay for it. Send your students to the bookstore, and when they buy the book, have them buy this little clicker device. So their innovation was around the distribution point, which was really innovative, which I'll, I'll first admit, I didn't, come up, I didn't think of that. I was just going down a standardized way. So I think to your point, I think you can be very innovative by you know, how do you take existing technology and products and bring it to new markets and bring it to new audiences, et cetera. So. I think it definitely fits the spirit were of what we're talking about today. Were they successful with that model? They were. Yeah? They were because they pushed it off. Students were willing to pay money for a clicker? It wasn't students. It was the professor mandating it. Just like they tell you to buy the textbook, yeah. they say buy the... Everyone and then the next iteration from that was the textbook companies woke up and they did the partnerships or the joint yeah. ventures with the clicker devices and it was package deal. And that, that has always stood with me. And, uh, <laughs> because I think we all think about how do you, how do you create the new innovation of the, of the widget or whatever, and it's not always just about the widget, it's about the model too. Yeah, business model innovation. Is so how are we doing? I think we're kind of winding down here on time if I'm... Last question. Last question, okay. I, I have the mic, so... You got it. <laughs> you're, you're good. Remember the power. All right, so... Um, my, uh, my question is about social entrepreneurship and it kind of relates with one of the earliest questions that was asked about you know, initiatives such as ending gender violence and things like that. More service driven than you know, some of the examples that we've been discussing where you, know, you produce a product, it solves certain situations and then you know, so you, you know, it's easy to narrow down to what kind of customers you're going to deal with. I run a communication agency back in Tanzania, that's where I'm from, and it's, uh, I went into this business myself about three years ago, and I would say it's pretty successful. But at the, the essence of, of doing this business, to me, has always been making an impact back to the community. My clients range from government, NGOs, and private companies. And in the communication arena, most of the time we find ourselves that we want to do something, but we depend on, uh, on money from sponsors and, and donations. You know, foundations who want to come, they, they're trying to push a certain agenda so they pay you to do the job. But we, so, you know, we are aiming to, to impact the community, but, you know, we get the revenue from somebody else and they sort of dictate which direction you want to take. So the main challenge you're facing is trying to be independent from these sources of revenue. So it's more of an, on, a, on a revenue model, yeah. uh, more of a revenue model problem. Do you have any examples that they may not necessarily be on a situation like this, but around the service-driven kind of business than, than, than a product-driven business that 
have have sort of like come up with 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 uh, sustainable revenue models that we can learn from. For, like service companies that have been able to break out of being a service company, but kind of, I mean, a lot of service companies try to then productize some of the services that they're offering. And, and that can be a way to kind of break out of... Um, chasing hours. Ch chasing hours, right? Because if you're exchanging mm. hours for money, you're never gonna scale tremendously, right? You can have a nice profitable consulting business, but it's never gonna scale, really. So you need to break out of that somehow. And that can, one way of doing that is trying to product, productize, trying to automate some of those services um, and, and kind of experimenting with that. And, and usually what, yeah. what, what, what service providers are really good at are, is generating like, or is being a thought leader, producing some sort of content that's, that's unique and different. And I think that's what Henrik is, is, is referring to, is that can, be, that can be packaged up and sold. For example, as, as a podcast or an ebook or whatever, mm -hmm. right? that can be sold 24 seven while you sleep. Uh, and those are just. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. What, what type of communication business? It seems like, is it like a public service kind of, uh, or, so like so, marketing so, or? Yeah, typically we, we, we design or we, we, we design uh, campaigns. So in the nature of the campaigns could be uh, commercial for companies, which would be more of advertising. Yeah. yeah? So we develop the messages, they, we build up the content, and we, we do media planning and sort of like getting the message out there. Yeah. For governments, they could be doing the same. They could have political or social marketing, you know, objectives that they have. Yeah. yeah? So, so the goal here is, you know, we're looking at things typically like creating a platform, for example, for, for, for young people to be able to engage and voice their, their exactly. you know, their issues and things like that. But in the country, no one really, you know, supports uh, an agenda or rather platform which, you know, doesn't seem to be working in his favor. So companies will want to, to, to advertise. So as long as they're not pushing advertising, they're not spending money. Governments, yeah. if you touch issues that sort of like, you know, uh, push them in question, they, that's not something they advertise. But the youth want to do it. But the revenue now from the, from, 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 from the audience is very minimal to sustain, you know, pay our staff and things like that. Yeah. But you're on the right path, right? Because if you can create some kind of platform so that you can put, position yourself uh, in a way where you own the channel and you are the go-to place where you can basically facilitate the most efficient kind of communication from whatever vendor it is, you might want to specialize in one specific industry to begin with. But if you can own that channel, then people are going to come to you because they're going to get the best bang for their buck, right? Here, here's a here's a perfect example, and it's Dartmouth related. There was a there was a Dartmouth senior that just graduated that created a company called Promote You, and you can check it out. In which large brands like the Coca Colas of the world wanted to basically engage with undergraduates and, and young people to to communicate their brands, and he basically created a platform that would allow these large companies to hire and manage like student ambassadors to push their brand. So that's a very, you know, that's owning the channel, but in a, in a product format where they actually created a web platform to help manage that process. Because then you've, you can start automating things, right? So instead of sending out a million flyers, you have the system in place now where you just click a button and then it automatically goes out to you know, a million relevant people. Exactly. Uh, and then you can start, you can charge a higher premium, plus you don't have to, you, you have automated the whole thing. So it takes, you know, of course, some money to build that machine, but as mm -hmm. soon as you have it, then uh, that, that's m much more scalable and, uh, and you can start getting some sleep money instead of exchanging time yeah, for money. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, before we wrap up, I just want to acknowledge and welcome the Young African Leadership Initiative that I think is here for a few weeks to kind of go through almost a boot camp workshop series around entrepreneurship. So let's just give a round of applause for them. Yeah, that's here. Awesome. <laughs> and we look forward to the entire campus to welcoming you, engaging with you. Uh, you guys were definitely part of this discussion tonight, so thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, and please just, you know, let me, let's have a round of applause for Henrik and Grace. Thank you, guys. And again, uh, I mean, I obviously highly encourage you to stay engaged if you have an idea or thinking about entrepreneurship. I mean, through series like this from the Rockefeller Center to the New Innovation Center, Dartmouth 
Pan Institution is making a real commitment to supporting, again, students, faculty, staff, community uh, around entrepreneurship. So don't just simply stay on the sidelines, get engaged, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at the amount of resources and people that are just willing to help you along the way. So, so thank you again for your participation, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thank you.